Hey guys, this is Mitch with Finepoint CGI, and today we're going to talk about how to create an Angry Birds like game inside of Godot. So, we're going to go through the process of creating our slingshot, creating our game manager. We're going to go through and create our birds. We're going to set up our physics calculations. We're going to talk a little bit about vector math. The hardest part, really, is the slingshot side of this because there's a lot of uh, math that we have to do. Um, we're also going to talk about the importance of state machines and we're going to talk about tweening and, and things like that. So that's what I have in store for you guys today. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the first thing that we should do is we should plan out our design. So we need to approach this with a design first and then build methodology. And the reason why is because it's, it's easier to follow a template that we've already built than it is to actually go ahead and just start coding. Now, if you want to just jump right into the code, you can go ahead and check out my timestamp getting into Godot, and then that will be whereabouts. You can go ahead and just start coding immediately. But for those of you who are interested in planning, let's start planning. So first we're gonna have a game manager and that game manager is gonna handle a lot of our states. So if the player's playing or if we are in menus or something like that, that's what that's gonna handle. And then we are also gonna have to have a slingshot manager. And that slingshot manager or slingshot script is probably going to have a couple of states that it needs to be in. So I'm not sure all of the states just yet because, you know, we haven't quite gotten into coding, but I can assume that we're going to have a few states. So we're going to have something like probably idle state, probably shooting state, probably shot state or something like that. And then probably a reset state would be my guess. I'm not sure yet because we're going to do a state manager instead of just doing, you know, straight up code. A state manager would make things a little bit cleaner, if that makes sense. So we'll have our game manager. We'll have our slingshot manager. We're going to need an, an interface manager, though we might not get to that point. And we have an enemy, right, which is our pig. And then we have our birds, right? All right. So is there anything else that we need? Um, I'm thinking that we're probably going to need a camera manager. And then we'll probably also need a building manager or maybe like a brick manager. And the brick manager basically allows us to, you know, despawn bricks if they fall down and take enough damage, they'll get destroyed. Much like how that game operates, much like how Angry Birds operates. Outside of that, I think that's everything that we're going to need. So now we got to figure out what our things are going to do. So our pig is probably going to have a health, you know, if health is you know less than x then he dies right and our birds are probably gonna have a if i was just shot and my uh speed is less than you know whatever our our velocity is that we want them to despawn it then we're going to go ahead and despawn it. And I'm thinking those are the major things that we need for our pig and our bird. For our interface, I don't think we need anything special. For our camera manager, I think we just need to basically say, hey, if, you know, if shot, then follow player, right? And I think our brick manager is probably going to do something similar to the pig, right? It is basically the same exact object. Now, slingshot managers where the majority of our code is going to be, it looks like, because we're going to need to do a lot of handling of movement and things like that. So what we'll probably need to do is we'll probably need to say, hey, if it's idling, do nothing, right? Um, if it's reset, then we're probably going to need to move a bird. 
to the slingshot. If we're shot, we probably need to do an impulse on our bird. Based off of distance to the center of slingshot, I'm thinking. And then we have our shooting. Well, maybe not. Shot might not. I think shooting would probably do that, actually. And I think shot would probably disable user input. from the slingshot so that way they can't reset their um, bird after they've shot and that way they can't go ahead and interact with the application while the bird's in, in air. It makes things a little bit easier and also it allows us to, um, if we have special abilities, we could also have special abilities being active during this time as well. Now I think game manager is probably gonna have a few states in it. So it's probably gonna have Probably going to have start playing, probably win, and probably lose. And our game manager has these three states. And these three states, basically, our interface manager gets affected by the win and lose, would be my guess. And the playing would affect our slingshot manager and our pigs and all of that happy jazz. Now I know that this is probably not standard UML, but this is still kind of planning out our ideas and, and kind of thinking of how we'd want to do this. So this is kind of what I'm thinking in terms of how things are going to be structured. It's something kind of like this. I know it's probably a little bit of a mess because it's me kind of scratch padding it all out for you guys. So you guys know what, what's coming ahead, but this should be a pretty simple little structure here. So let's go ahead and jump into Godot and let's go ahead and start building this out. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is we need to go ahead and create our game manager. Now, what we can do is we can go ahead and just right click in here and go ahead and make a new script. Let's just call it game manager.gd. And I'm gonna go ahead and make it inherit from a node 2D. And I'm going to go ahead and just allow it to exist like that. I'm going to open it up and this is going to be our global script. So it's going to be accessible everywhere in the project. So what we can do is we can put in functions that, you know, need to be here for the application to run. So things like enums or something like that would probably be good to be either in here or in a utility function, right? Or a utility class. Um, I think I'm going to separate out my enums with my game manager. I think I'm going to make a new script and call it utilities.gd. And that's just going to give us a little bit more flexibility. And I'm going to say no 2d and I am going to go ahead and put my enum in here for utilities. So this area here is literally just going to be filled with different utility stuff, if that makes sense. So back to the game manager. What does the game man manager need to function? Well, first, it's going to be processing data, right? It's going to be running things every single frame. So we're going to need our process function. Now we're going to do what's called a state machine. And a state machine is if this if this system is in a specific state, we're going to do stuff. And I know that that sounds very generic, but that's basically what a state machine is. So what we're going to do is we're going to do what's called a switch statement or a match statement inside of Godot. So we're going to say match, and then we need to match it on something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to match it on an enum. Okay. So what we're going to say is we're going to say var current game state and we're going to match on that game state. Okay. And we're going to make that game state equal to something. So first we're going to say enum game state. And this is where we're going to define our states. So first we're going to start our state as start. 
And then we're also going to need one for playing, right? Because we're going to have one for when we are playing. And then we should probably have one for, I imagine, win, right? And I imagine we should have one when you lose, right? So that way it can fire off, hey, you lost, hey, you won, things like that. And I think that's all we'll need for our enums. Now I'm probably gonna move this into our utilities class here, but we'll get there once everything kind of works. So we'll say, hey, our current state is equal to game state dot start. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna say, hey, our game is currently started, right? We just started it, but we're not doing anything. And actually, we shouldn't say play. We should say play. Or we shouldn't say player. We should say play. Now, we're going to use a match case to kind of help make this more organized. So we'll say, hey, we're going to do a match on our current game state. And then we're going to say, hey, if we're in game manager, or I'm sorry, if we're in game state dot start, then, whoops, then we can go ahead and do some stuff, right? So this is assuming that the player is doing nothing. So we're going to say pass. Okay, so the, the game just started, but nobody's doing anything. It's just kind of sitting there. Now, what other states do we need to, to have in here? Well, you can see we have uh, start, play, win, and lose. So let's fill that out. So game state dot play, and we'll also pass for right now. And then we'll say game state dot win. And then we'll just put print U1 with an exclamation point. And then we'll say game state dot lose. And we will say print you lost. So what this is going to do for us is it's going to allow us to control our game in general, right? So if, for instance, um, we only want a section of code to run during our start code or during our play code, we can do that. Now, this is going to get filled out with a bunch of stuff, and I'm not going to show you guys just yet because we're not quite to that point. But we are going to have stuff like we're going to get all the nodes in a group and we're going to check to see if that size is equal or is less than zero and it, or equal to zero. And if it is, then we know that we won or lost the game, right? So that's kind of the point of this. Obviously, or unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. So let's move to another section of the game. And that section is going to be our bird. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a bird. So we're going to go create a node 2D, right click it, go ahead and add a child node. Let's add in a rigid body 2D. And then we'll go ahead and right click add in a node, add in a collision shape like that. And we will go ahead and make that into a rectangle. Then let's go ahead and make our rigid body. If we right click on it and we move down here, we can actually go ahead and make that our scene root. So now our rigid body is our scene root and that's what I want. So we'll go ahead and right click on this and add in a sprite node. And that should about do it. If we just drag our icon up here as our texture and we go ahead and take a look at our collision shape and make sure it is the correct size, that should be about all we need to do for our bird. Let's go ahead and name this bird. Now, this is important because we need our bird and I'm going to go ahead and save it. We need our bird to have collision and to have a rigid body. Okay. So what this is going to do is it's going to allow our bird to get affected by forces and get affected by gravity, right? So the character falls down while it's being used. So we need to go ahead and disable the ability to be dropped immediately on play. And the reason why is because if we immediately allow the bird to drop, then it's not going to get affected by that slingshot, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to right click and attach a script and we're going to call it bird simple enough. And what we're going to do is we are going to go ahead and set our mode, which is our kinematic body mode equal to rigid body 2D kinematic. And what that's going to do is that's going to say, Hey, I don't want to move by physics. I want to move by code. So you're basically just saying, 
I don't want to deal with physics or any of that kind of stuff. I just want to deal with code and call it a day. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to turn on our rigid body when we throw the character. That way they actually arc and fall down due to gravity. So we need a function to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and come down here and say funk throw bird. And this is going to be a capital T because I'm going to be using it outside of my uh class here so other people are going to access this so i'm going to make it a capital t because that's generally how i like to code now i know that godot has its own standards and i'm sure that i don't follow them very well but this is my standard on how i generally code now what we're going to do is we're going to say mode is equal to rigid body 2d dot mode rigid and what that's going to do is that's going to make us go back to a rigid body so that way we can go ahead and use our physics engine to handle our character flying through the air and falling. And that's all we should need for this uh, script just yet. There are some additional stuff we're gonna need to come in here. Like we're gonna need to be able to delete the bird after a specific timeout and if a specific amount of velocity is not uh, being done, but we'll get there when we get there. So next we need to go ahead and create a new scene and we need to make it a 2D scene and we will make it our slingshot. So what our slingshot is gonna do is it's going to launch our bird when we click and drag on it. So this slingshot is gonna be made up of multiple different objects. The first one is gonna be, of course, our sprite, right? So we can bra drag in our sprite. So for our sprite, what, we're, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and use this slingshot sprite, which is from the Angry Birds game. So. I don't actually have a slingshot sprite and I can't seem to find one. So I'm going to scale it down a tiny bit, but the concepts work. So just use whatever kind of sprite you guys can find. Um, unfortunately, I can't provide it to you because this is copyrighted, I'm sure, in some way. So from here, so from here, what we need to do is we need to add in our lines for our band, right? So when you pull back a slingshot, there's some bands here. And what we're going to do is we're going to right click and add in line 2D. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow us to have a slingshot that follows wherever we put the bird, right? It'll just kind of follow the bird and the lines will follow that location. Simple enough, right? So what we'll do is we'll open up our vector uh, pool vector tool array. I will make two points. And I'm going to go ahead and make this, I don't know, like minus 10, let's say. So I have something to grab onto. We'll go ahead and grab this, drag it up here. And we'll go ahead and grab this and drag it back. And I'm going to make my width something like, I don't know, probably about that big, give or take. And then we're going to duplicate our line 2D. We're going to call our top one left line. And we're going to call our bottom one right line. And I'm going to grab my right line. I'm going to drag it back to about here-ish. And that should do it. Now, we also need the ability to touch and grab on to this um, bird, right? Because we're trying to throw this bird. So we need to uh, have some kind of collision area to detect that the user's clicking on it, right? So what we can do is we can right click, add in a child node and add in an area 2D. So we can actually pull back those collisions and we can name it whatever we want. In my case, I'm going to say touch, touch area. And I'm going to go ahead and right click on this, add in a child node. And I'm going to go ahead and add in a collision shape 2D. And we're going to come down here and we're going to add in a circle shape. And I'm going to make it fairly large, something like this, so that the user has... because. Because this is a mobile application, people are going to be using their thumb to be dragging this back. So we don't want it to be a tiny collision area or they're not going to be able to click on it. And the last thing that we need right now is to be able to have a center point of our slingshot here. So I'm going to go ahead and add in a child node and I'm going to add in a position 2D. And the reason why is because we're going to be doing lots of vector math and I find it easier just to have where my position is versus actually going out and calculating it. Now we could calculate it pretty easily by just taking the 
x value minus the x value of these two right and left points and then just basically calculating it but i like having an actual object that if i wanted to change where the center was of my slingshot let's say they get a slingshot upgrade it's not necessarily easier but it's more flexible so i'd rather just go that route and i'm going to name this center of slingshot simple enough and from here, I'm going to go ahead and right click my slingshot, attach a script and call it slingshot.gd. I'm going to grab onto my area 2D. I'm going to go to my node and I'm going to do an input event. An input event will fire every time an input happens. So anytime the user touches the screen or clicks or presses any keys on the keyboard, this event fires. So you need to keep that in mind. So that way you do a little bit of extra sanitization before it gets to your code because you don't want it to fire off if, you know, somebody hits the F key, right? And then suddenly your bird's flying in the air, right? So we'll go ahead and double click on that and we will link it to our slingshot. Cool. So now that we've got our scene set up, let's go ahead and set up our variables and our ready function. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to come up with our slingshot state because we're doing state management in this tutorial series because I'm trying to teach you guys about state management and about why states are cool. In one of our previous tutorials, we talked about, you know, uh, doing a character controller and we didn't use states at all. And now I'm showing you guys why states are cool. And then we'll probably go back and refactor that code to make it states. But what we can do here is we can say, hey, var slingshot state and then i'm going to come up to the top up here and i'm going to say enum sling state or slingshot state if you'd like and we're going to have a couple of states here so we need at least one idle and i'm thinking we're going to need one for when they're pulling the bird and then i they need one more when they throw their bird so bird thrown and then they're probably going to need one to load the new bird in right for uh when the bird goes from one line one section of line to the next and then gets put into the bird um launch pad right so we can call that one reset let's say now when we come down here to our ready the first thing we need to do is we need to set our slingshot state so slingshot state is equal to sling state dot idle because nothing's going on the game just started no worries now we need to go ahead and get our uh slingshot points right so what we can do is we can come up here and say var left line and var right line and we can go ahead and set those here. So left line is equal to dollar sign left line and right line is equal to dollar sign right line. Simple enough. And now we need to go down to our process here and do some state management. So we have all of these states here, right? So let's go ahead and create a state manager for this. So what we're going to say is match slingshot state and if the state is slingshot.idle then we're going to do some code in here then we're going to do the same thing if the slingshot is dot pulling we'll do some code in here and then if the state is bird thrown then we will do some whoops then we'll do some code in here and then finally if the state is reset we're gonna do some code. So that'll be the basics of our little state manager, right? So when we're idling, what do we need to do? And I don't think we necessarily need to do anything. We're idling, we're just chilling, nothing's going on, no worries. When we're pulling though, that's when things get interesting, right? So we need to say, hey, if the user has their mouse down, then we need to do stuff, right? So if the user's clicking and dragging on the bird, we need to do stuff. So we'll say if input dot 
is action pressed and you'll see that we don't really have a actual mouse button. So let's go to our project, project settings. And let's go ahead and add that. So we'll go to input map action. We will call it left underscore mouse. We'll go ahead and copy that. And then we will add in a key and we'll make it a mouse button. In our case, it'll be the left mouse button. Let's go ahead and add that and close. We'll say quote left mouse. So if they are pressing the left mouse button, then we need to go ahead and get our mouse position, right? So if the player is clicking on the bird and we move our mouse, we need to get that position. So we'll say, okay, var mouse position is equal to get global mouse, whoops, mouse position. There we go. Now let's go ahead and print that. All right, let's save this and let's go ahead and play this real quick. So play our scene and you'll notice that when I click, nothing seems to happen. Nothing comes out of my, my output and nothing seems to work. Well, why is that? Well, the reason why is because we are not changing our state on click. Okay. Remember how we created this little event on touch area input event? Well, we need to go ahead and set our slingshot state to pulling. So let's go ahead and go slingshot state is equal to sling state dot pulling. All right. So now if we go ahead and come over here, oh, I need to go ahead and run it through this, not through that. You'll see that nothing happens, right? And the reason why is because if I maximize this, we can't see our slingshot anywhere. And the reason why is because we don't have a camera in this scene. So let's go ahead and add a camera temporarily. This is going to be something that we're going to remove almost immediately, but we'll have a camera. We'll go ahead and set it as our current camera and let's go ahead and hit play scene. Sorry. And if we click, you'll see that now we're getting our mouse position. So if we click and we move it around, you can see that we are getting our mouse position. Perfect. That's exactly what we wanted, right? So now we can go back to our slingshot and let's go ahead and set up our points to follow our mouse. So what we'll do is we'll come down here and we will say, okay, left line dot points. And since we are calling dot points, that's an array of all the points that are in our line. So we're going to say one because we want to get back the first index if we go back to our slingshot and we click on our line you can see here one and two well one and zero i guess so one and zero you can see that we want to get back this one right we don't want to get back this one we want to get back this one because that's the end of our point so we'll come back to our script we'll say one is equal to mouse position and then we'll go ahead and duplicate this and do the exact same thing, but with right line. So I'll just do that. And that should do it for that. So we'll go ahead and click on play and then we'll click. And you'll see that it's now following our mouse. Perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. Now we need to go ahead and set it up so that we don't go outside of a specific boundary. So if you look at this and we hit play again, you can see that I can pull this all the way back. I can pull it as far as I want and it doesn't care. And that's not okay, right? We can't do that. We need to keep it within the bounds of a specific area. We can only shoot within a specific area. So how do we do that? Well, what we can do is we can come up here to our print statement and return. So that way we can kind of insert some code here. Let's go ahead and do some vector math. And I know vector math is scary. So I'm going to walk you guys through it and it's going to be great. I promise. So if mouse position dot distance to, okay, dollar sign center of slingshot dot position, because that's the center of our slingshot position then we need to go ahead and see 
if it's over a value. And in my case, I'm going to set that to a hundred for right now. I don't know what the value is going to be at the end, but we're going to see what it's going to be. So if the distance is over a hundred, then we need to go ahead and tell our, our mouse positions distance to be less than what the actual, um, mouse where the mouse is at, if that makes sense. So this is where some of the crazier math kind of comes in. So what we're going to say is mouse position is equal to our center position. So dollar sign center of slingshot dot position dot distance to. Okay. And then we need to set it to wherever the player is going to be. So let's say mouse position because that's where we expect it to be okay we're going to say mouse position is equal to mouse position minus dollar sign center of slingshot dot position and then we're going to do what's called normalization so we're going to normalize that and we're going to multiply it by the value that we have here so 100 in our case and then we're going to go ahead and add in that vector again from our position. So we'll go ahead and just say plus that vector. Okay, now I know that that's really fast and very confusing. So I'm going to walk you guys through this. So what we're doing is we are taking our current mouse position and we're minusing our, our center of our slingshot. Okay, and what we're doing is we're saying, okay, get these two points minus them together right and then we're going to normalize that vector and what that does is it tells you the direction of my vector okay so it's saying hey in this line what's the direction of this line and then we're multiplying that direction by a hundred and then we're going we're going ahead and adding our position of our slingshot and what that's going to do is if I go ahead and bring up paint because I'm fancy and I like to use fancy tools. So what we're doing is we're getting a point in space, right? And we're getting our mouse position and we're drawing a line between the two. Okay. And then we are going ahead and getting the direction of this, op of this vector. So it's basically saying, turning this into a point. Okay. And then we're saying, okay, multiply it by a hundred. So that way we can get from this point to this point because the distance here is a hundred, right? So we're saying, uh, now that we got our, our direction. So basically think of it like this. We've got two points. We're drawing the line. We're getting the direction. So we've got this object here and it knows to go this general direction towards our other point, right? So it's saying, okay, multiply that direction by a hundred so that they touch. And then we're offsetting it by our center of our slingshot position. So where our slingshot would be like this, this is how our vector math is. And then we need to move this object up and over so it matches to where it is because all of our calculations are being done at, at zero, zero. So this is technically zero comma zero. So that's kind of how this works, if that makes sense. Basically, the easiest way to understand it is this is just keeping you inside of a circle. Effectively, you're just saying, hey, I'm going to keep you inside of the circle so that way you don't go out of the circle when you're moving your mouse, more or less. So now what this is going to do is it's going to set our uh, points to that position, which I mean, arguably mouse position is probably not a good uh, name for it. It's probably better to be something like location or maybe distance. So maybe we can change that. So let's go ahead and just call it distance. I think that would be a better value for this than what we are using currently. So that makes more sense and you guys don't have to change it. I'm just changing it for clarity's sake on my end and we'll go ahead and get rid of this print. So now if we go ahead and hit play and I keep making that mistake, go ahead and hit play and we drag, click, click and drag. You'll see that it gets caught here because what we're doing is we're calculating our vector distance. See? So 
if I were to, let's say, not add in our current position, and I were to play this, and I still am going to make that mistake, and I hit and I click, you'll see that it goes off of the origin of the scene, not the origin of the object. See that? So that's why we do this little addition here is because we're re-offsetting it. So what we're going to do is we'll go ahead and come in here and say else colon, and we will go ahead and do basically similar stuff, right? So we're going to say else location is equal to get global mouse position and var distance is equal to location dot distance to our center of our slingshot. So dollar sign center of slingshot dot position. And what this is going to do is it's going to get us back a distance between these two objects. And the reason why is because we're going to want to launch the bird based off of the distance that it is. So if, for instance, you're throwing this bird, you don't want it to throw it at a specific rate. We want it to throw based off of the distance between the center of your thing and how far you pulled it back, right? Because slingshots, if you pull it further back, it does more damage, right? But if you put it kind of closer, it doesn't quite do as much damage. It doesn't go as far. So we need to make sure that we calculate our distance between these two points so we can determine how much force we need to throw at the bird, if that makes sense. So what we can do now is we can say, okay, we need to throw our bird. So let's go ahead and say var velocity is equal to dollar sign center of slingshot dot position minus wherever our player position would be. So our location, right? And from here, we can go ahead and throw our bird. Now, if I remember correctly, our bird actually has a throw bird function. So we're going to need to make sure we call that. But how do we call that function? Well, the easiest way to call that function is to come into our nodes and add in a group and call it player. So I'm going to go ahead and add in a player group, and I'm going to go ahead and add in a bird group. So I have both. Just in case I want to access just the current bird or all of the birds, right? So we'll go ahead and save that. We'll go to our, back to our slingshot, and we're going to go ahead and access that uh, group, if that makes sense. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and get our players. So we'll go ahead and say var player is equal to get tree dot get nodes in group. And we'll go ahead and grab our player. And then we will go ahead and force our player to move, right? So we'll say player dot throw bird. And then we need to impart our force onto that player. So we'll say player dot apply. And you'll see that we're not getting any of our syntax highlighting. So let's go ahead and fix that. So let's say player is equal to player as rigid body 2d and that's going to go ahead and give us some syntax highlighting here because i'm getting tired of not having syntax player dot apply impulse and we'll go ahead and say all right we need to do an offset so we don't need an offset because it's right at the center of our bird so vector two and we'll make that an empty vector two. And then we also need to give it velocity. So the impulse of vector two velocity, right? So we'll say velocity. There we go. So now that's going to pass our velocity to our player. Okay. And we need to tell our game manager, hey, uh, we're now playing our game. Right? Because we need to update our game manager, say, hey, they've thrown the bird. It's it's go, it's on, right? The game's going. And what we can do to say that is we can go ahead and access our game manager. Now, how would we go about accessing our game manager? Well, we could access it through get nodes and group if it's in the same scene, right? That would work. But game managers typically aren't in your scene, right? They're typically on the outside running in the background 
for everybody to access. So what we can do is we can go to our project, we can go to our project settings, we can go to auto load and go ahead and auto load our game manager and click add. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna make a global variable for this object that's gonna be running in space. So we'll go ahead and come down here and we will say game manager dot current game state is equal to game manager dot game state dot play. And that's going to allow us to tell our game manager that we are now playing this game, that the bird's been thrown and the game has started. How are we going to test this, right? If we hit play, okay, and we click, I mean, it's mad. You can see it's already angry, right? So that's not okay. So what can we do? Well, first things first, we might have a bug because I didn't even do anything and the game crashed on me. So, oh. I know what's going on. Okay. So we have a bug. You'll notice that as soon as we hit play and then any kind of interaction happens, it immediately goes into throw bird mode, but we don't want that, right? Because what if I'm just sitting here and I'm not touching this, if I'm not doing anything and I'm touching different parts of the screen, well, we don't want that, right? You can see here that this input event is being fired. If I put a breakpoint here, just by me going into that section, it's firing off this, which is setting our slingshot state. And we don't want that, right? So we need to make sure that it's a mouse event or some kind of touch event, right? So what we can do is we can say, hey, if slingshot state is equal to sling state dot idle, then I'm going to go ahead and allow the user to do this, right? But that's not going to solve our problem because even if we run this, right, and it pops up and we hover over here, it still tries to do it, right? And that's because we're not checking if the event is a mouse button. So we're going to have to check for that. So if event is input event mouse button, and then we're going to need to make sure that it's pressed. So event.press. And now that we've checked for that, what that's going to do is that's going to make it so that this will never run even if I hover over it. So if I come in here and I hit play and I hover over this, you'll see that nothing happens. When I click, now I can do stuff. And then when I let go, it attempts to throw my bird, but my bird doesn't exist. Right? So now what can we do about this? Well, we can go ahead and make a scene. So new scene. Let's make a 2D scene and we'll just call this game loop or something like that. Something simple. We'll go ahead and drag in our slingshot. Whoops, that was my GD script. Drag in our slingshot and then we'll go ahead and drag in our bird. Cool. So now we've got a bird and we've got a slingshot. Sounds pretty good. And we're going to need a camera. So let's go ahead and add in a camera like this and we'll go ahead and go to our inspector and go ahead and say that's our current camera so you can see here's our current camera if i hit play and i just go ahead and i select this scene because i'm cool with this scene being our our main scene so let's save it and just call it main scene and i'm going to hit play hit select and i'm going to select our main scene when i click and i drag and i let go you'll see that hey non-existent throne bird and base array our player exists it looks like but throw bird does not seem to exist so let's go ahead and take a look at our bird script and let's see what's going on throw bird that should work unless i did lowercase p for player which is possible i've been known to do that nope it's there so let's see oh i know why because we didn't set this as our array we need to get back the first element of our array which is our player that's why so let's go ahead and hit play if we drag this back and let go, you'll see that our object just goes flying. But it's not, A, it's not following our mouse position, right? And B, I mean, he just went flying. So, I mean, it's kind of right, but not quite. So, let's come up here and let's make him follow our mouse cursor. So, let's go ahead and do this code here and honestly at this point i think this and probably center of slingshot needs to be moved up here so 
Let's go ahead and do var player and var center of slingshot. And let's go ahead and set them right here. So we'll say, well, at least let's set one of them here. Dollar sign center of slingshot dot position. And we'll go ahead and set that to our center of slingshot. So center of slingshot is equal to that. And then we could just come in here and kind of clean up our code a little bit because I'm not a huge fan of this and it's extremely inefficient to do these calls to go find an object and get their position every single like second. It's extremely inefficient. So there we go. We'll do that. And we can't necessarily fetch back our player immediately because if we did that, our player, after our bird despawns, then our player would no longer exist, right? So we're going to need to check that. I'm going to guess every frame. So let's go ahead and grab this control X and let's pull this up here. Uh, I don't know if I want it to do it that way. Yeah, I guess we can do it that way. That's fine. So we'll do this player. Yep. And let's see if that works. And then we'll say player dot position is equal to distance. Let's see if that works. So we'll click and you'll see that he is now there and he is getting launched, which is perfect. Now, the first problem is the distance that he's getting launched. I think he's getting launched possibly too much, which is kind of surprising. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. What's his velocity? 84. I mean, that's not awful, but it's not great. So let's go ahead and... Well, let's leave it for now. I was going to mess around with it, but I honestly, I can't be asked. I think that we're going to need to put some division or some multiplication in here to kind of make it, I don't know, better. Uh, but we do need to do one thing. You'll notice that if I hit play and I pull this back and I do that and I get rid of that, you'll notice that he gets absolutely launched. So you can see if I pull this back about here, he gets launched the same amount no matter what the distance is. And that's because we need to multiply it by our distance. If you remember that we got our distance uh, right here by doing location.distance to slingshot. So let's go ahead and multiply this by our distance. And what that's going to do is that's going to impart force on this based off of the how close or how far away we are to our center point of origin. And we may need to, you know, divide out our velocity or something like that because we are doing some multiplication here. So let's see. Yeah, he's he's gone. So let's go ahead and divide this by, I don't know, like 50. And let's see how that goes. That's more reasonable, but I think we might need to divide it by 100. It's kind of better. Oh, I think I know what's going on, actually. So what's going on is every frame, it's applying impulse to our bird, I think. Yeah, because it comes through here. It does this. And it comes through here and then does this every frame. We need to change our, our, our slingshot state so that it doesn't do that. So let's go ahead and do that. That's my fault. So let's go ahead and say... Slingshot state is equal to sling state dot bird thrown. And that should stop that from happening. Let's see how that, how that fares now. Oh yeah, that's much better. Okay, cool. So let's set this to just velocity and let's see what that looks like. It's still way too much. So we will absolutely divide it by 50 and see if that's better. All right. That's reasonable. Okay. So you'll see that we can pull it back and it'll part different force. So if we pull this back and let go, you see it just kind of drops. And if we pull it back very far, it imparts a lot of force. So that's perfect. That's exactly what we want. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and... 
reset our lines here. So you'll notice that when we play and we pull back and we let go, our lines are still right here. We don't want that, right? We want them to be in the correct location. So let's go ahead and set that. So left line dot points one is equal to center of slingshot. And let's do the same thing with our right line. There we go. Oh, I missed the capital L. There we are. So now when the user throws, it goes back, which is good. Also, we're going to need to do this on startup as well. So let's come up here and just paste that in here because copying and pasting code is always good code. So it starts off like that. That's much, much better. All right. So now the next major thing that we need to do is we need to go ahead and make it so that the player actually loads up in the correct location. Cause you can see here that until we click the player is not in the correct position. So what we can do is if we go up to our slingshot, we'll go ahead and tell it to move the player to the correct location. So we'll go ahead and say, var player is equal to get tree dot get nodes in group quote player and then we will go ahead and do zero and then we'll say player dot position is equal to center of slingshot and that will go ahead and automatically snap the player on start to the correct location now you'll see that the player is kind of above the slingshot and the reason why is because we need to make sure that in our main scene that our bird is kind of in between the slingshot almost if that makes sense so we could just do something like this and put the bird below it or behind it like this, but that's a little weird. Next, we need to go ahead and make it so that our bird despawns after it's being after it's been thrown. So what we can do is we can come into our game loop. Let's go ahead and right click, add in a node, and let's add in a tile map here. And let's go ahead and grab a tile set from draw itch.io okay so now that we're over here let's take a look at some of these tile sets and let's see if we can find one that kind of matches what we're going for and you know peaceful night field might work uh, maybe this pixel art painted style might work let's go ahead and grab that one so we'll grab the pixel art painted style and we'll go ahead and download this one and we'll say hey i already paid for and we will say, no, thanks. Just take me to the downloads and download this. And we'll go ahead and extract this. So we'll right click extract. And we will go ahead and pull the PNG files here. If we go ahead and copy it, we'll go ahead and drag this in and drop it in. And Godot should pick it up. If it doesn't, we might need to open in file manager. And then let's just go ahead. Nope, oh, it seemed to have picked it up. So. There it is. Okay. So now that we have this here, let's change all of this to pixel art because it is pixel art. So we'll say 2D pixel and re-import and that'll go ahead and re-import those. And then let's go ahead and create our tile sets. So we'll go ahead and click on our scene, click on our tile map, go to inspector, click on our tile set over here and click new tile set. And that's going to go ahead and create a tile set down here when we click on this. And you can see here's all of our tile sets. Now we have a lot of things here that we can play around with, but I'm pretty sure there's a tile set right here that we can just drag and drop in. Now from here, we need to go ahead and make our single tile. So we'll say new single tile. We will go ahead and enable snapping. So you can see that these sizes are incorrect, right? So what we can do is we can draw on here and we can actually change our snap options here. So that way we can make it the correct size. So what we're gonna do is we will see what size we need it to be. Maybe something like 64. 
by 64 maybe that might be not quite right so let's adjust it to maybe 16 by 16 that's closer to what we want so let's go ahead and just grab it like i want to say like this and we'll go ahead and make ourselves a tile using that and we'll go ahead and add our collision here just like that We'll go ahead and make another single tile. We will make it this one. And we will go ahead and create our collision as well. So that way we have something to collide with. Now, I'm not going to go through a lot of detail to try to make this perfect or beautiful or anything like that. I'm just going to go ahead and make a few tiles here. So that way we have something that we can use to create our art assets. And then do new single tile drag this up, collision, do the same thing. There we go. All right, so now if I click back on my tile map, you'll see I have a bunch of tile stuff. So now we need to make sure that this matches our original tile set. You can see how this doesn't quite match. So if we change this to something like maybe 32 by 32, now it's slightly too small. So let's say, let's see. Well, 59 is too large, obviously. 44 is too much. So it looks like we kind of have a, a weird number here. So something like 47 by 45, give or take. That's okay, though. So we'll go ahead and drag this out. So now we have some kind of tile, and we will go ahead and drag this up. And again, I'm not trying to make this pretty. I'm just trying to make this work. So that'll work for me. And then we'll go ahead and play this and let's see how our little guy reacts. So we'll throw him. He hits the ground and drops just like we expect. Now, there are some things that you'll notice. First things first, when we throw him, our camera doesn't follow the player. So if we throw him far, he just disappears off the side of the screen. And you'll also notice that our little bird guy doesn't despawn when he drops to the ground. See that? So he just kind of sits there and we can't bring another bird into the slingshot if our other bird is still there, right? Because it's considered the main player at this point. So we need to go ahead and despawn the bird. So let's go ahead and go up to our bird script here. And we'll go ahead and jump into that. I'll bring this down real quick. And in our ready and in our process function here, we need to go ahead and create a timer of sorts. So that way we can actually have it wait a specified time. And it's up to you on what time you want it to be. In my case, I'm probably going to go with something like two seconds or maybe a second. But first, we need to go ahead and create our timer, right? So we need to say var t is equal to timer dot new and then we'll say t dot set weight underscore time and we can set our time so we'll say something like two seconds and then we'll say t dot set underscore one underscore shot is equal to true Right, or we'll pass in true. And basically, that means that this timer is going to run once, and that's it. It's not going to keep running as time goes on. So once it runs once and it finishes, then it's done, and it doesn't continue to run it again, if that makes sense. And then we'll say self dot add child t, and that's going to go ahead and add our timer to us as our child. And then what we're going to do is we're going to wait. Yield t comma quote time out and then we're going to queue free and we need to go ahead and start our timer so if we come up here that was my mistake t dot start and that'll go ahead and start our timer so now if we hit play you'll see after two seconds it disappears perfect right well not so not quite perfect because we don't want the bird to just disappear right we'd like it to disappear after it's been thrown so we're going to need to add in a small state machine inside of our bird. So let's go ahead and come up here and start building that out. So what we need to do is we need to determine if the bird is thrown or if the bird is not thrown, right? So we'll go ahead and create an enum. 
and we will say birth state. And we will say not thrown and thrown. And then we need to have a uh, global variable for our state. So we'll say var state. And we will say our state is bird state dot not thrown. So we're going to start it off with not being thrown. And then we can go ahead and come down here and change our state to bird thrown, right? And that should work, right? So if we go ahead and hit play, our state has been changed, but our bird is still disappearing immediately. So if we come up here and we say, hey, if our state is equal equal to bird state dot thrown, then we're gonna allow us to delete our bird. But this is gonna introduce a problem and I'll show you. So if we drop him and he's thrown, that's perfect, right? He disappears, we're like, yay, that's great. But it's not happening. The counter starts immediately. You can see how it, he doesn't come to a rest necessarily. So if I kind of throw him, well, I'm very bad at throwing my bird apparently, but you get the idea. If I throw him with just a little bit of force, he disappears almost immediately. And the reason why is because we need to wait until our character becomes a minimum velocity. Like if, if it's going slow enough to be deleted, because you don't want to delete him if he's in midair, right? And moving. So we're going to come up here and say, and, and, uh, rigid bodies have a thing called velocity or uh, linear velocity. And what we can do is we can say, and. linear linear velocity is less than or equal to a vector two of some kind so we could say something like vector two you know two comma two right and so if he's going slower than a his if his velocity is slower than two units per i think it's second then he disappears right now we could make this a flexible value. For instance, if we wanted to have a bird that explodes or something like that, we might want to make this a more flexible value. So you might want to throw it up here, right? Instead of doing it, you know, down there, you could probably just put it up here and say minimum velocity. That would make this a little bit more flexible. But for the case of this tutorial, I think this will be fine. So if we go ahead and hit play, you'll see that no longer, no matter how long we wait, nothing's going to happen. If we throw them, And then he hits the ground. Now he waits and then disappears, which is exactly what we wanted. Great. So now that we have our bird stuff kind of figured out, now we need to figure out our camera. So for that, I'm going to go ahead and make a camera controller because I do like my controllers. So go ahead and right click on our camera and we'll go ahead and attach a script to it. And we'll just call it camera controller. And we will go ahead and start, you know, coding this out. So first we need to go ahead and get our starting position because our camera is going to be moving through the scene, but it needs to reset to our original position. So let's go ahead and start out with that. So we'll say var starting position. And we'll come down here and say starting position is equal to global position. And then we're going to need to go ahead and get a hold of our slingshot and our player. And the reason why we need to get a hold of our slingshot and our players is because our camera needs to know what state our slingshot is in and what state our player is in to determine if it should follow the player or if it shouldn't follow the player. And now we need to go ahead and get a reference to our player. So we'll go ahead and grab that because we need to know where the player is. So we'll say, let's go up here actually and go var player. And we'll say player is equal to get tree 
dot get nodes in group and we will go ahead and grab our player i'm i can't remember if it was capital p or not it is okay so we'll go ahead and grab our player and let me go back to my script and we'll say zero and that'll be it for here and now inside of our process function here we need to follow the player so first we need to make sure that we're okay with following the player right because we don't want to follow the player if the player if the slingshot hasn't fired off yet we don't necessarily want to follow the player right so what we can do is we can say hey if i'm following my player right so if if following player and we're going to need to make a var up here for that so var following player if we're following our player then we need to make sure that our player is valid right if we need to make sure our player exists so let's say if is underscore instance valid player then we need to go ahead and do some more checks here right so if our player exists and if we're following our player then we need to go ahead and follow our player, right? So we can say var player position is equal to clamp, and I'm going to clamp our player position. And I'm only going to do it on the x axis instead of doing it on some funky. Um, you know, I don't want to follow the player moving up unless we're doing some kind of space birds game, which we could. But in my case, I don't really want to. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually clamp the distance that our player can go. And the reason why is because if for some reason they get out of the map, I don't want the, the camera to just fly off into the ether of the map, right? So I'm going to clamp it to something like 500, right? So that way it doesn't uh, blow up on us. So we can say ah, about zero to 500. So as long as they're between zero to 500 units, we're good, right? And we could adjust this and make it into a variable up here that we export for each level. That way we can make sure that it doesn't go past that specific point. It's also really nice if like it's the edge of the level, if we could figure out where that is, we could say that's the edge of where the camera goes and then that way it provides kind of that nice um cinematic view so it doesn't follow the player constantly but in this case i'm going to do it this way for now and we're gonna to have to set our global position after this right so we're saying hey uh we're getting our player position and now we need to set our position as in the camera to our new location so we'll say vector two and we will go ahead and pass in our player position, comma, starting position, Y. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow us to follow the player and um, keep our Y axis. So we're not going up and down. Now, we could do that if we wanted to. We could just say player position, you know, Y, and then it would be fine, right? We could just say, there you go. But in my case, I don't want to do that. Now, once we're done, if the player has been despawned, right, we need to go ahead and stop following the player. So we'll say following player is equal to false. So no, so this code will no longer be ran. We're no longer going to follow our player. And then we're going to take over and tween ourselves back. Now, I don't know if you guys know anything about tweening, but basically tweening allows you to move between two values in code and kind of progressively move to that number. So you give it a starting number and then it'll count all the way up to the number or down to the number in a nice smooth fashion. So we can go ahead and right click our camera 2D. We're going to go ahead and add in a tween node and then we'll go back to our camera and we're going to tell that tween node. So we'll say tween dot interpolate property. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow us to interpolate a property. And we're going to, we need to move a property or we need to move an object. So we're going to move ourselves, And then we're going to move our position value. And then we got to choose 
where we want to start from. So in our case, we want to start from our position and we want to move back to our start position. Next up is the duration of time. In my case, I'm going to say two seconds. And then we get to pick our tween type. Now, it's really hard to see here, but these all have different values here. And I'm going to choose linear in my case. The only reason why I knew it was linear is because it had an L at the, the side here. I wish they'd fix that bug, but that's okay. So translinear. And we're going to hit comma one more time. And we need to choose our tween type. So how do we want it to smooth? And in our case, we want in out. So comma, ease in out. All right. Now, this is great, but it's not going to work. It's not going to do anything. You need to notify tween to start or else it won't start. You're setting up your tween. You're saying, hey, get ready to do this thing. And then you need to tell it to do that thing. So we have to say dollar sign tween dot start and that will go ahead and start our tween so now if we did everything correctly it should work let's go ahead and hit play let's throw it and you'll see that nothing happens why did nothing happen right well the reason why is because we have this hey if following player right but we're not setting it anywhere right we're not following the player so what we need to do is we need to tell our camera that it's okay to follow the player. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add my camera to a group and I'm going to say camera and I'm going to tell my slingshot here to tell the player camera that it can move. So we're going to say, Hey, when our bird gets thrown, right? Hey camera, it's okay to go ahead and do your thing. So we will come into our else. We'll come down here to our throw bird section and we're going to go ahead and get a reference to our camera. So we'll go ahead and say get tree dot get nodes in group. Whoop. Quote camera dot and then from here we can access our camera members. So if we look at our camera, we have following player. So we'll go ahead and grab that is equal to true. And that's going to go ahead and set our following player. And I need to actually set my base to zero. That's my fault. I got back my array, but I didn't set my index to zero to pull back the first element that I find. So that's my fault. So now if we go ahead and hit play, we drag this and we throw it, you'll see that now it's following the player and you'll see that it stopped here. And the reason why it stopped here is because the player is, uh, it's past 500 units. Now you'll see that we did go back to our, our slingshot, which is exactly what we wanted. So we need to tune that 500 a little bit. Let's just make it something like 5,000 for now. Let's give it a big number and then we'll tune it later. So let's go ahead and save that. Let's fire off our bird and let's see what happens. Oh, there we go. Now it's doing what we expected. Our bird stops. He slows down and he dies and then it drags us right back to our slingshot exactly like we expected. So next, let's go ahead and give ourselves something to hit. So let's go ahead and start with bricks. I think bricks would probably be a fun thing to, you know, hit, do damage to. Now, I don't know if I have an actual brick. Okay, so I'm sitting here in Krita, and I'm going to go ahead and make my own instead because I couldn't really find one. So let's go ahead and just kind of snag one of these and steal it from this little sprite sheet we have. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab, I don't know, like this segment here or something. And I'm just going to copy it and I'm going to go file new and I'll make it sure 1080p is fine. I mean, it's a teeny tiny little sprite, but We'll go 1080p and then we'll go ahead and crop it like this. Enter and there we go. We've got ourselves a little tiny sprite that we can use. So now what I'm going to do is to add a little bit of depth to this just because I like to be a little on the fancy side. We'll go ahead and just right click on this. Actually, they have a bright color here. So I'll grab this bright color. I'll just drag it up here like this. And then I'll drag this dark color like that. And that should help with making it look just a little bit more, I don't know, blocky, I guess you could say. 
I don't like that color, so let's do that instead. Yeah, that'll work. There. Now it's like a little block almost. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and save this. So save as, and I am going to go out to my Angry Birds tutorial, and I'm going to go ahead and drop this out as a PNG. And it is going to be a brick.png. We'll go ahead and save that. And then I'm going to go back to Godot. And I should see it right here, brick.png. Perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. So now we need to create a scene, right? We need to create our brick. So we'll go ahead and create our, our scene, create a new scene, create a 2D scene. And then let's go ahead and right click add in a child node, add in a rigid body 2D. Let's go ahead and right click on it and make that as our scene root because we want our rigid body to be our scene root. Then we're going to go ahead and right click, add in a node and go ahead and add in a collision node. So we'll go ahead and do a collision shape and we will come over here to our shape, click on it and create a rectangular shape. So now we can go ahead and right click and attach our sprite. So we'll add child node sprite. We'll go ahead and hit enter and we'll drag our brick up into our texture. There we go. Now you'll see that our brick looks absolutely ugly. So we'll go ahead and click on that. Go to import, change our preset to 2D pixel, re-import it. And there we go. It's back to its beautiful glory. And we'll go ahead and make it just a little bit bigger like that. And we will change our collision shape to be something like this so that it perfectly matches our little brick. We're going to hit control S and name it brick. All right. And now we can just, if we don't want our bricks to, to be destroyed after being hit, we can just leave this like this if we'd like. So we can come to our main scene and actually come in, right click, add an a node and then add in a node 2d right call it bricks and then just basically drag in our brick scene right and move it over to something like here and actually i think they're a little on the small side we might need to make them bigger because our bird is huge and if we assume that our bird is the is a single unit in size this needs to move up in size so let's go ahead and move it up in size let's drag this up and let's just kind of hold shift and let's make it just a little bit larger and do the same thing here. We'll make this just a touch bit larger like that. And let's see what that does. Is that better? It's close. I think we might need to go a couple units bigger. So we'll just kind of go with something like that. There we go. There we are. That's, I think that's good enough. So we'll go ahead and grab our brick, move it to somewhere like right here. And you can see that our floor doesn't quite touch. That's probably because I didn't do a very good job of creating and chopping up the tiles. So that's my fault, but we'll go ahead and grab this and control duplicate it, drag it over, control duplicate, bring it up and then rotate it like this 90 degrees. And just go ahead and place it like that. And then let's just control duplicate, drag this over, control duplicate, and drag this up. And we might just be okay with that. So let's zoom our camera out a little bit. So if we kind of just move our camera 2D over, and I forgot that we have a camera 2D on our slingshot, don't we? Let's go ahead and get rid of that. And let's go to our camera and then zoom it out a tiny bit. So that way we can actually see what this looks like here. So if we hit play, nice. Now you'll see that that's a little funky. And I know, I think I know why, and it's my fault. If we look at our brick, see our origins right here, right? Well, our origin needs to be at the center of our object or else our uh, rotational force is kind of funky. So let's keep it at the center. Save that. 
And then we're going to need to rebuild our project, which is my fault. So I'm going to do that real quick. So I'll drag this up. And drag this over. And I will go ahead and drag this up. And then drag this over. And that should do it. Let's hit play and let's see what it does. There we go. So now if we drag our little bird back and we throw it. Well, I'm very bad at my own game, as always. So let me bring these guys a little closer so I can actually actually hit them. Um, so we'll just bring it a touch bit closer. And now if I drag this back and I throw it. We might need to up the uh, the velocity here. I don't think it's powerful. It's not powerful enough. Let's see. Well, now it's too powerful. Um, goodness. There we go. See how it hits the bricks and they all fall down. Perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. Now, if we want the bricks to be destroyed upon being hit, right, instead of bunching up like this and having a bunch of physics objects here, we can actually go ahead and um, fix that, right? And also, you'll notice one other small bug, and that's if we throw our bird, it snaps us back to that bird, right? So we're over here, but if we throw it, you see how it snaps us back? We don't necessarily want that. We want it to follow only if the player has passed that threshold. So first, we'll fix that. Then we'll move to the bricks. And then I think after that, we can go ahead and build a pig. And I think that'll be our next step. So let's go to our camera. And let's go ahead and set that up real quick. So if we're following our player, what we need to do is we need to say, hey, hold on a minute. We don't want to follow the player unless the player dot position X is greater than whatever our camera position dot X is. And then we want to follow our player, right? So now if we shoot this off, now the camera catches once the player has crossed a threshold. That makes it feel better. It makes it work better. And it's just overall generally going to feel better for the user. Now we need to go ahead and set up our bricks. So if we go back to our bricks and we click on our rigid body 2D here, we right click and attach a script. We'll just call it brick. That's fine. We need to go ahead and basically set up the same code for our pig that we do for our bricks. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to have a health value, right? So var health, right? And we'll set that equal to something like five, okay? And we need to go ahead and say, hey, whenever an object enters our body, then we need to determine how much damage we have to do to the brick, right? So if we click on our rigid 2D, we look at our node and we look at our signals, we actually have a body entered right here. So go ahead and double click on that and connect it to our rigid 2D bodied enter, right? First thing we need to do is we need to check if the instance is valid. So if the instance, so is instance valid body then we can go ahead and continue through our code because we don't want to destroy ourselves if it's a null object, right? We don't want to just die because, oh, well, it's a null object. I'm dead, right? So we don't want that. And we want to make sure that our object is a rigid body because we don't want the tile map to just suddenly blow up the application, right? So we could say if body is rigid body to D, then finally we can go ahead and do our thing. So we can say, hey, body is equal to body as rigid body 2D. And the reason why I'm doing this, you don't have to do this section for line 22, but I'm doing this because I want syntax highlighting because I'd rather cast it as an object and make sure that it's correct than not, right? Syntax highlighting makes my life a little easier. So we'll say var damage is equal to our body dot linear velocity dot length, okay? And what this means 
is we are saying, hey, I'm going to take this velocity. I'm going to get its velocity as in how fast it's moving. And I'm going to get the length of that vector. So how fast the player is moving. So the linear velocity is kind of like the direction and the length is the, the, the speed at which that player is moving or that object is moving. Okay. And then we can say health minus equals our damage. And then we could say, hey, if health is less than or equal to zero, then we can go ahead and destroy ourselves. All right, let's go ahead and test this and see how it goes. So if I throw them at it, it doesn't seem to do anything. So that's not good. Is this even being fired is the first question. So let's hit play and let's see if this is even fired off. It is not being fired off. Okay, so that's our first problem. So let's take a look at our main scene. We do have our signal. It is attached. That's good. If we take a look at our brick, our signal is attached. Oh, I know what's wrong. We are not detecting collisions. So we need to turn on contact monitoring. So we'll go ahead and turn that on and we'll say contacts reported one. Let's hit play. And you'll see now we hit our break point. Sweet. But you'll see all of our bricks just disappeared. Why is that? Well, let's take a look. So if we put a break point right here and we go ahead and hit play, it's going to immediately break right here. And let's see what our damage is. Our damage is 27. So first things first, for it to just move that tiny bit and suddenly it's gone, that's a problem. So let's go ahead and multiply that value here by something like 0.01 maybe. Let's see what that damage value is and we'll go from there. So from them just settling on it, it's about 0.2 damage. That's not bad. Um, we're going to need to probably do some kind of code that tells it, hey, don't um, monitor until after everything's kind of settled. But for right now, I think that'll work. So now if we pull this back and shoot, you'll see that some of those things got destroyed. So if we come back and shoot it again at it, let's see. It's not too bad, but it didn't quite delete anything. So we might need to just do 0.1 instead. Let's see how that does. There we go. That's not too shabby. And you guys can fiddle with this and make it however you would like it to be. But that's how we can go ahead and destroy our stuffs. But... How can we wait to let everything kind of settle before we start doing damage to our own stuff? Well, what we can do is we can come up here and say, hey, var t is equal to timer dot new. And then just like previously, t dot set underscore wait underscore time to something like three. And then we can go ahead and say t dot set underscore one underscore shot to true and then we can go ahead and say hey i'm going to add this to myself and then i'm going to go ahead and say t.start and then i'm going to say yield t comma quote time out and then that's going to allow us to go ahead and say hey we're going to wait until our timeout is completed. And then we're going to go ahead and say contact. Oh, it's mad at me. Let's see. Oh, I missed this. And we have an unexpected indentation. That can go. There we go. And we can go ahead and say contact monitor is equal to true. Okay, so now that we're done with our bricks, we're going to go ahead and create our enemy. So we're going to go ahead and go scene new scene click on 2d scene then we're going to right click add in a child note add in a rigid body 2d we're going to go ahead and name that pig and we are going to right click it and go ahead and make that our scene root now we can go ahead and right click add in a child note add in our collision so c-o-l 
and collision shape to D. And then we can right click, add in a child node and let's add in a sprite. Now for our sprite, we don't actually have an enemy sprite. So I'm just gonna use the Godot icon here. So we'll just drag that up here. And there we go. And for our collision shape, let's go ahead and make that a rectangular shape. And let's kind of bring that up so it's the correct size for our little Godot guy here. If we control S and we save that as pig.tscn, we can come to our main scene and we can actually just bring in our pig.tscn. And let's just drag and drop him in here and move him on top. So now if we hit play, we have a little pig guy, which is cool, but you'll see a, our, uh, bricks are being destroyed by him and B you'll see that obviously if we hit him, he doesn't disappear or anything like that. He just falls over, right? So how can we handle that? Well, first him destroying bricks is probably because Let's see. Let's take a look at our bricks and let's see if we, we are waiting for three seconds for contact monitor. Or maybe we're not actually click on our bricks. Oh, we have our contact monitoring on. So if we shut that off, there we go. Now he won't be destroyed when a pig gets on there. And if we hit it, it does get destroyed, which is perfect. Great. So now we need to be able to destroy our pig. So much like we did with our bricks, we're basically going to do the same thing, but we're going to make it slightly different. So what we're going to do is we're going to right click our pig, go ahead and attach a script and name it pig. That's fine. And then we're going to go ahead and click on our node here. We're going to go click on our node and we are going to go ahead and do body entered here. So we'll double click on that and we will connect it to our pig. And much like our brick, we're going to say, Hey, if body is rigid body 2d, then we're going to go ahead and process that. And much like our brick, if you remember, we checked if instance is valid, we probably should do the same thing here. So we'll come up here and say, Hey, if is instance valid and then we'll pass in our body and we'll go ahead and tab this in and then we're going to say hey if body dot is in group and our group is going to be player then we want to go ahead and destroy ourselves what that means is if the player hits me directly i'm going to get destroyed you know, because the uh, power of the bird means if he touches him, he's, he's he's dead, right? But if he falls and takes damage, we want to go ahead and cause damage, right? So else var damage is equal to body dot linear velocity, right? Remember the direction that the person is going, right? Dot the length, so the speed that they're going, multiplied by, and in our case, we should probably make it the same across the board, right? So between our brick and our pig. So we said 0.1, so I will do the same here. So 0.1. And now, just like with the with the brick, we need to have a health. Var health is equal to 150, right? And then we'll come down here and we'll say, okay, health minus equals damage enter if health is less than or equal to zero, then we need to queue free and we need to be destroyed. So now you'll see our little guys there. We throw. And hit him, he falls, and he did not get enough damage to kill him. So let's see how much damage we did. So let's. Oh, I don't think it's firing off, actually. Let's see. Oh, probably because Inspector. Yep, we don't have our uh, contact monitoring turned on. So let's turn that on. Let's go ahead and refresh this. 
So just because he touched it means that this is going to go. So let's allow that to run through. And he took 0.64 points of damage. That's fine for now. And then let's see if we knock him over. How much damage is that? 0 0.00000005. So that's not a lot of damage. That's one. And it looks like that killed him. So let's see why. Hold on. Let's take a look at it. Oh, I think because he touched the player. Yeah, because he touched the player. Okay. Well, let me see. Let's go ahead and multiply this by 10. And then let's go ahead and say... Yep, that's fine. Health is damage. Yep. If health is that, that's fine. And let's go ahead and go up here and let's basically take our brick code here. Let's go ahead and just copy it and paste it into our pig real quick. So we'll basically just add that timer code in here. And then let's go to our pig and shut off our contact monitoring. And that should about do it for us. Let's see. Well, he keeps touching the uh, player, I think. Let me see. Well, he's going to touch the player again. Well, I think that works, though. I mean, we can keep fiddling with these numbers and keep running tests and see what we think. But, yeah, I think that works. Awesome. So now that we have this completed, let's go ahead and move over to our game manager and let's set up kind of our win loss system. So if you come over here, you can see game state is win, game state is lost. Let's go ahead and set that up. So what we can do is we can say, hey, var birds is equal to get tree dot get nodes in group. And we could say, birds and I want to make sure that my bird is in a node group it is good and same thing with my pigs my pigs are not so we'll go ahead and add them into a node group here because they need to be in a node group or else they're not going to be able to count for our system so we won't know if the um if there are any pigs in the system or if there isn't any pigs in the system so now we'll go back to our game manager we'll say hey grab all of our nodes in our group for our birds var pig is equal to get tree same thing dot get nodes in group and we will do pig i think i did pigs i could just look over here and there we are and we can say okay if pigs dot size so we're going to grab back our array right and we're going to say hey if pigs.size is equal to zero, then current game state is equal to game state dot win. And if else if birds dot size is less than or equal to zero, then current game state is equal to game state, whoops, not game manager dot lose so the nice thing about this is we want to check our pigs size first and then our bird size and the reason why we want to check them separately right with the pig size being first is because if you win on your last bird you don't want to lose right so if you were to say if bird size is less than or equal to zero and it was the second one then the game stay would be lost and you would lose so now that we have this, let's go ahead and hit control S and let's see how this goes. So we've got our pig here. We're going to launch at our pig and he's gone and you see, we have you lost. Now, why did it do that? Well, let's go ahead and hit play. We got nothing. We launch and now suddenly we are losing. So let's see what's going on here. So we're pulling back bird 
We're going to game manager, birds, not bird, bird. There we go. Let's go ahead and hit play and let's try that now. You won. Awesome. Cool. So now that we have our game state saying you won versus if we come over here and we click and we launch our bird into the floor here and he disappears, you'll see you lost. Sweet. Simple enough. Now, what if we want to be able to handle multiple birds? So for instance, if you have two birds or three birds or however many birds you would want in the scene, right? Well, the easiest way to do it would be to have a load next bird. So what we can do is we can come over to our slingshot and where our slingshot has our reset code right here, we'll just go ahead and load our next bird to reset ourselves to the idle state, right? So what we can do is we can say, hey, player is equal to get tree dot get nodes in group player zero and that's going to pull back our next bird right because the way that this all works is it allows us to fetch um get nodes in group will fetch all the nodes and then index them by um top down like this so as long as your nodes are top to down your system will work so your first bird will fire then your second then your third then your fourth and that's basically how that will operate so now we can say as rigid body because we want it to be a rigid body 2d and then we need to go ahead and interpolate our property so that way we can move our bird to our location now we don't have a way to interpolate it without using a tween so we're going to need to go ahead and add a tween to our slingshot so let's go ahead and do that and let's go back to our slingshot and type dollar sign tween dot interpolate property and for our object, we're going to say player. And for our property, we're going to say position. And for our initial position, we're going to say player dot position. And for our final position, we need to get the center of our slingshot. So we'll say center of slingshot. And our next one is duration. So I'm going to set it to something like 0.5 seconds and we will say comma and we'll say trans linear comma and we will do ease out in or ease in out in this case all right so now that we have that we need to go ahead and start that property so dollar sign start all right and now something that we need to do is we need to reset our slingshot to idle right we need to say hey it's good. But the problem is, is if we do it like this, right, it, it's not necessarily going to work. We need to go ahead and, um, check if the player is in the correct position before we go ahead and say, yeah, we're, we're good. So we'll say player dot global position is equal, equal to our center of our slingshot dot actually it's already a position so we don't need to do that and then we can say sling shot state is equal to sling state dot and then we can move back to our idle section which is perfect now we're going to put a breakpoint here and i'm going to go over to my main scene and i'm going to duplicate my bird so i have two birds so we will control duplicate and let's just pull him back behind and let's go ahead and hit play. And then we will fire our bird off. You'll see he disappears, but nothing seems to happen, right? We can't click on our guy. We can't do anything. Why is that? Well, if we go ahead and we look at our slingshot code, we are never moving over to our sling reset code, right? As a matter of fact, there's no way for us to get to that point unless our bird gets destroyed. So we need to tell our slingshot, hey, to move into this uh, new state. 
So we'll go over to our bird and have our bird tell our slingshot that it's in the correct, that needs to be moved over to its new state. So we're going to need to get a reference to our slingshot, but we can't just pull a reference out of nowhere, right? And since it's in a totally different area and a totally different scene, we can't just say, oh, dollar sign, grab it, right? We could do something like get tree dot whatever, right? Get tree dot get node and try to fetch it and find it. But it's generally easier just to click on your slingshot, go to your node and go ahead and add it to a group. So we'll just go ahead and add it to the slingshot group. And then when we go back to our bird right here, we can say get tree dot get nodes in group quote slingshot. And I'm going to make sure that that's correct. So let's click on it. Slingshot, no capital S. Perfect. Zero dot slingshot. I believe we called it. Let's see. Click on our slingshot. Scroll up. Slingshot state. So let's go back to our bird. Make sure we just paste that. Is equal to, and we're going to have to do this exact operator again, which is extremely inefficient. So let's control X that and say var slingshot is equal to that and then let's go ahead and say slingshot dot slingshot state is equal to slingshot dot sling state dot and i believe we wanted to move our sling to reset so go ahead and copy that and we'll go to our slingshot and paste that in or i'm sorry to our bird and paste that in and that'll go ahead and allow it to switch to our new state so if everything's done correctly we should be good if we go ahead and hit play and we fire this boy off like that he cues free and then our new guy moves to that location and then we should be able to click but you notice that we can't why is that? Well, you'll also notice that our breakpoint that I set right here did not get fired. So why is that? So with vectors, you cannot just say, hey, is this vector equal to this vector? Because floating point precision is extremely complicated to get correct. So what you need to do instead is you need to say, hey, is this close to this? Not perfectly on top of it, not even close, like it needs to be within a specific distance. If it's within this specific distance, we're good, right? So we need to do that. So if we go ahead, come up here and let's go ahead and change this. There's a reason why I put uh, parentheses around this. Um, if we go ahead and we say, okay, I want my player dot global position minus my center of slingshot. That's going to give us our vector offset, right? It's going to say, here's the distance between these two objects. Okay. Cause you're, you're minusing it. So you're finding the distance. You're basically drawing a line right between the two. You're saying, here's the distance between these guys, between these two points, right? Then you need to get the length dot length. Okay. And if that length is less than 0 0.1, then we can go ahead and jump into idle. And now you'll see suddenly we have a breakpoint, which is good, which means everything should be working now. So if we go ahead and refresh and we fire this off, you'll see he flies down. He queues free. Our next guy goes up and we can now click on him. Awesome. That's great. Now you'll see that we have an invalid index zero on base array. You'll see that it's trying to fire off a slingshot reset because our bird queued free. You'll see here, our bird deleted itself. Invalid index zero on base array. Even though we won, we have an error here. So we need to check against that, right? 
because we can't just assume that that object's not that that object's always going to be there. So what we can do is we can go ahead and say var birds is equal to, and then just go ahead and fetch this entire section here and paste it, and then we can just say if actually I think lives would be better lives is equal to this if lives is greater than zero then go ahead and do this section and we'll say lives lives and we'll get the first index of that so now we can go ahead and play this throw our bird and fail and it's not happy with me because I forgot to say dot size, which is my fault. There we go. Now let's try it. So I'll fire him off. He drops. Boop. All right. And then I grab him. Fire him off. I won. He drops. Disappears. And the game is done and nobody can interact with anything or do anything crazy like that. Perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. Okay. So at this point, this tutorial is probably going to be like an hour and 30 minutes. So I'm going to cut it here and we'll have to continue this on another episode because unfortunately, you know, after it gets to an hour and a half, it, it gets a little hard to, for people to watch these videos. So, that's all I have for you guys today. We went over how to create a bird, how to create slingshots. We talked about vector math and we talked a little bit about normalizing vectors. We also talked about interpolating properties and how to, you know, interact with the physics engine and kind of how kinematic bodies work to an extent. We also talked about, uh, how to do game states and what game states are and why they're important and why state machines are important, but that's all I have for you guys today. So if you like this video, go ahead and hit that like button. Hey, if you dislike this video, go ahead and hit that dislike button because I am here to make content for you guys. This entire tutorial series is a viewer suggestion. So I do take your suggestions very seriously. And if you guys have a suggestion, please leave them in the comments below. I'm more than happy to take a look at it. I'm working on a tutorial for the Silent Wolf API currently because a person suggested it and I figured that it would be a cool idea for everyone to use. And hey, if you guys have any questions about this or you just want to have a chat, throw them in the comments below or jump on my Discord. Link is in the description and we'll do our best to help you as much as humanly possible. Everybody on there is super cool and is always helpful. But that's all I have for you guys today. So thank you so much again for watching and I will see you all next time. Thanks.